Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is November 2nd, 2022. This video is called The Second Death, and it is part four of my series called The Obedience of Faith. I want to do this video because I think it's uh, very easy to become confused when you're reading the book of Romans. Um, especially the first eight chapters. Uh, my wife and I were talking about it the other day and we just said, boy, it's convoluted. Seems very convoluted. Seems very hard to make sense of it. There are some things that we need to understand better in order to understand what Paul is saying in the book of Romans. And so today I'm going to talk about the second death. Before I begin to get into the scripture, I want to uh, bring your attention to a couple of books that would be helpful. First is The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. This particular book is uh, about 42 years old. I uh, bought that book shortly after I was married and um, I have a lot of underlining in, it, underlining in it. And the book was very important for me in giving me a good foundation in Christian doctrine. I strongly encourage you to read it because you will learn things in that book that you just don't hear anywhere else. Uh, for example, one of the things you will hear in that book is that man is made of three parts body soul and spirit <clears throat> and this is what Paul says in 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 body of course is our corporal corporeal uh, tangible being our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And our spirit we receive from God. And it's the, the coming together of the spirit and the body that produces our soul. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, Verse 7, it says this. This is after uh, God created man. He goes through it again in chapter 2. And this is uh, the Darby translation. It says, And Jehovah Elohim formed man. That'd be the Lord God in many versions. The Lord God <clears throat> or the Lord I am. Formed man, dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So you have man here who is formed of the dust of the ground, that's his tangible body. God breathed into him, that's the Spirit of God. And then it says man became a living soul. That word in the book of Hebrews, or I'm sorry, that that word in the Hebrew is nefesh, which means soul. It's different than, um, well, when you, th you have various words dealing with life. Some translations say man became a living being or something like that. But you have, in the Greek, you have the word bios for just the, the tangible uh, body. You have the word suke for the soul. And then you have the word zoe for spiritual life. But a lot of times in the New Testament, you will have just the word life appear. And it's really the word suke, which is dealing with the soul. And we're going to be talking primarily about the soul of man today. That's why I'm taking time with this. The... Um, 
Second book I want to encourage you to get is this one by Andrew Jukes called The Second Death and the Restitution of All Things. So today's video is primarily going to deal with the second death. And the second death deals specifically with the soul. So we have three parts in our being, physical body, our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then we have a spirit that is able to communicate with God directly. I'm sure all of you have heard that, heard the phrase, the second death, that's in the Bible. That phrase only occurs in the book of Revelation. You, you don't have any other scriptures that ever say the first death or the third death. But there are three deaths. The first death is the death of the Spirit. And that's what happened to Adam when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember, God said to him when he was showing Adam the Garden of Eden, he said, you may eat of any of the trees in this garden except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Because in the day thereof, in the day you eat it, you will surely die. Well, most people seem to write that off and say, well, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And Adam lived to about 963 years. So he died within that first thousand years and that was a day. And they think that, that, that God was dealing with talking about his physical body. No, it isn't. It's not talking about his physical body. It's talking about his spiritual life. He no longer had the relationship with God that he had before when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He could hear God. He could commune with God. Just as a very simple matter because of that spiritual sense that he had. But when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that spiritual sense died. He no longer was able to communicate with God in the way that he had before. And he did not have, um, he did not have the same type of life any longer it became a life like ours, where, where it's difficult for us to hear in the Spirit. It's difficult for us to, to hear God in the Spirit. For anyone who is, um, has not been born again, virtually impossible, because the... You remember when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, He said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He can't see it. Why? Because his spirit is dead. The being begotten from above, receiving the earnest of the spirit, is when our spirits are quickened with life, with the life of God, and our spirits suddenly become alive toward God again. They were dead until that time. There are several uh, scriptures that deal with that, like Ephesians, um, 
chapter 2 says you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So here he, he now, he, he's gotten into all three of the aspects of men. We were dead in our spirits. We were dead. We lived in the passion of our flesh. That's the, the fleshly part. Carrying out the desires of the body, the flesh, and the mind. The mind is the soul. And so he hit all three aspects of man in these verses at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So we were dead. Our spirits were dead. And then here's the famous phrase, by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, this is very similar to what he said in Romans chapter 6. Remember in Romans chapter 6, he started it by saying, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old man was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We know that our old man was crucified. Well, what is our old man? Our old man is all that aspect of us that is non-corporeal. It's not our bodies, but it's our mind, our will, our emotions. Even our dead spirit, dead toward God. Everything about this, about this, this body of death was crucified with Christ. Now, after doing that last video, I went and I looked at some things in this book, The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. It reminded me of some things that I had learned long ago from him, just profound things. And what, one of the things that he says when he's talking about Romans 6, Romans chapter 6, is that we reckon ourselves as it says in verse 11, So you must also reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God by faith. But the critical point that he made was that faith can only come by revelation. By revelation. Takes me back to uh, Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
until the word of the Lord is revealed to us, we can't have revelation. We can't have faith because faith comes through hearing the word of God. And that's why I'm teaching this today to bring you to faith in this idea if you don't see it yet. And I think that by spending some time focusing on the second death, it's going to quicken some things in your spirit. And the word of God will be quickened to you. One of the verses that came to me um, is um, 1 Corinthians 15. Well, I wasn't going to go to this, but uh, I'm going to go to this one first. Verse 45 it says, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. That means he became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. I'm going to go to this in my Bible so I can uh, see what verse they reference with that. I'm thinking they probably go to the verse in Genesis that I just quoted. Genesis 2.7. So in 45, 15.45, what I'm doing is I'm looking at my references in the middle of uh, the page of my English Standard Version. And they will have a reference for this in 45. It says, yes, cited from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. That's why it's so important to have a Bible like this with good references because you can go and see what the writer is talking about. Now, the verse I wanted to go to was in... Um, 1522, which says this, starting with 21. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So, as in Adam, all die. So in Christ shall all be made alive. I believe this is talking about the spiritual death. All men have died in Adam. All men will be made alive in Christ. So, in the scripture, what we have are three deaths. The first death is the death of the Spirit. That occurred when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The second death that we have is the death of the soul, and that is what the Bible primarily deals with. Almost all of the Bible is dealing with the death of the soul. Then the third death is the death of the body. Now most people believe when they uh, come across the word death that it's dealing with the death of the body. For example, I'll take you to a um, one that everybody looks to 
as the one verse that says that uh, reincarnation could not happen. And that is Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Every man will die once, and after that comes the judgment. very mysterious verse because that's that's something that people uh, will hold on to and say oh you must you must believe you must receive Jesus now or you're going to fall into judgment after you die well the Bible doesn't teach that Instead, the Bible teaches something dealing with our souls that has to die. So let's go to, <clears throat> let's read um, Matthew 22, a parable here. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. That just happens to be the Jews the first time. For 2,000 years, it has been anyone who would hear. Verse 4, again he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered slaughtered and everything is ready come to the wedding feast but they paid no attention and went off one to his farm another to his business while the rest seized his servants treated them shamefully and killed them well that totally describes what the jews did to jesus and his disciples but it also describes what the religious zealots have done to the faithful christians for the two thousand years since then the king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He was speechless. You know, there's a lot of people who believe that they are dressed for the wedding. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. We need to have our garment on, our wedding garment. Let's look at... Um, Revelation chapter 3. The seventh church to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. 
Now this describes much of the church today. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You do not have your wedding garment on. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. To those whom I love, I, approve, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So there's still time for people to repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So are the, there are many in the churches who are not appropriately dressed. Let's go to now to Revelation. Well, I think I'll take you to um, all of the verses in Revelation that deal with the second death. Let's go. The first one is Revelation chapter 2. That's verse 11. This is the church of Smyrna. Verse 10, 11, 12. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Which death is that? and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. I think here primarily he is talking about the third death, which is the death of the body. But any martyr, anyone who's willing to die for his faith, also also has achieved the second death. And so the reason why Christ says the, this one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death is because he willingly gave up his mind, his soul. He gave up all of his will, his emotions, his mind as he was willing to be killed for Christ. So I think that verse 10 is talking about the third death, which is the physical death, but this one will not be hurt by the second death because in this life he already died to the things of the world. So let's look at, again, to see this more clearly, let's look at another uh, teaching of Jesus. We'll go to Matthew 10 this time. Verses 26 to 39. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So here you have two of the deaths. The body's death is the third death. The soul's death is the second death. Do not fear those who can kill the body, 
but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Gehenna is the word here. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Think, think of how, how do we deny the Lord? We deny him by our actions. We deny him by not upholding and standing up for truth in our daily lives. And he makes this more clear here in uh, the next verses. Verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You know, how often do we allow our parents to offend our spouses, for example, and not stand up for them because we're afraid to stand up for truth? As we take the word of God into ourselves, as we wash ourselves with the word, we need to then apply the word, and that means to be bold enough not to deny the Lord before others. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. How many people give up everything to get that <clears throat> reprobate son or daughter out of jail? They love their son or their daughter more than they love Christ. They love that son or daughter more than showing the truth to their son or daughter. The truth, our adherence to the truth, has to take priority even over our sons and daughters. How many families who lived moral lives accepted their homosexual son or daughter as if their sin was okay and never ever confronted them about it? And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his soul will lose it. And whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. In my version, the ESV, English Standard Version, they, they use the word life here. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The word is soul. Jesus is saying that we have to give up our own desires, our own aspirations for him. So we lose the, we lose the things that we want in this world in order to find the things that Christ wants. And in doing that, we gain our souls. Now, this is all about the second death. Because if we do not win our souls, if we, if we, in other words, if we do not lose our natural soul here, then we are going to have to go into outer darkness, which is another word for the second death, which is another word for the lake of fire. 
we're going to have to go there in order to finally lose our soul. And then it's after that that judgment comes. See, we will not be finally judged until we lose our souls for Christ's sake. So let's now go to the other uh, verses in the book of Revelation. So let's see. Revelation 26. verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. They will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, these are the Kodeshim who, are, who take part in the first resurrection, who will become priests of God, and they will rule for a thousand years. The second death has no power over them, because they already surrendered their souls to Christ. Then the next verse is 20 verse 14. Verse 11 begins the great white throne judgment. I'll go ahead and start at 11. So 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, first you have the dead are judged according to their works. So they're judged there, but then if their name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then 21, verse 8. Start with verse 5, 21, 5 through 8. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This, of course, is Christ. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who overcomes will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So the second death is the lake of fire. Remember, hell, back in chapter 20, hell was thrown into the lake of fire. 
say, people think hell is, is going to be a place of eternal torment. How can that be? When hell itself is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But notice he mentions about 10 different sins here. And this would not be an all-encompassing list. We learn in many other scriptures of different sins, things that God considers to be sinful. And the people who have not walked in accordance with the truth still are holding on to their sins. And the people who are still holding on to their sins are those who have not been written in the book of life. So in Romans chapter 6, when Paul says that the old man has been crucified with Christ, it's talking about our old soul primarily, and I think it may include our old spirit, the dead, the dead spirit, the, the spirit that was dead toward God, was crucified with Christ. So by faith, by faith we understand that. I don't feel it. You know, I've never felt that I have been crucified. It's something that I receive by faith. And one of the things that can help us to, to see that, I think, is to understand really what is going to that cross. It's not my body. You know, God doesn't tell us to crucify our bodies. He also doesn't tell us to become ascetics to where we simply withdraw from the world and try to keep any type of sin from ever touching us. Like there's stories of people, monks who used to get on, up on top of a pillar and meditate as if that would keep them from sinful thoughts. <clears throat> The way that we escape the sinful thoughts is by allowing God to wash us with his word. Remember, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. But then, after that, he said, you must be born of water in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two things are required. When we receive the faith to believe in Jesus, our spirits are quickened. That is the new birth born from above. So our dead spirits have been quickened. We become alive in spirit toward God and are able to hear him. And then, as we read the word, the spirit of God then takes that word and washes us, cleanses us, renews our mind. We are to be washed with the word of God. We are to take the word into ourselves. And then, it's not that our body or even our soul is not going to want to sin anymore. Because at least at the first, you're still going to have plenty of um, 
thoughts and ideas like what you always had before you believed in Jesus. What you have to do is by the Spirit now, because your Spirit now can exercise authority over your soul, your soul then exercises authority over your body, and you simply say, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's what you will find that you do. So you will learn what sin is, just as Paul said, I would not even have known what sin was unless the law said, do not covet, or do not do this, do not do that. So we know what sin is. Sin will still try to move our flesh to do something wrong. But what we have to do now is we have to exercise our soul to obey our spirit to do what's right. So we reckon that our old man, our old soul, our old thoughts, our old way of life is crucified with Christ. And that we live now according to the spirit. So we put to death the sins of the flesh by the spirit. Now your spirit needs food. What is that food? The Bible tells us over and over and over again. Come, buy, eat. Eat the good food that I give you. In Isaiah chapter 55, Jesus speaking. Jesus speaking in John chapter 6, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Talking about the word. Eating the word. Jesus washing the disciples' feet. What was he doing? He was demonstrating the washing of the word. And so, especially now, as darkness covers the earth, we need to wash ourselves in the word, in the word, with the word. We need to feed our spirits with the word. We need to renew our minds with the word of God. And then we will have the power to say no to sin. And that's what we need to do. Because there are th three deaths. The death of the spirit that is healed and reconciled to God when we believe in Jesus. The death of the soul that we deal with now or God will deal with later if we don't deal with it now. And finally, the death of the body. Okay, now, as I've said before, the Bible primarily deals with the salvation of the soul, not the salvation of the spirit or even the salvation of our bodies, which would be receiving our glorified bodies. There's a few more scriptures I want to draw your attention to. One of those being uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 9 to 10.
remember it was 927 I read earlier that said it was appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. Verse 28 reads, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And then keep going into chapter 2. Very interesting, because now he, he explains Christ's death in terms of Old Testament prophecy. And I'm not going to uh, get into that today, but it's very interesting. It's also in chapter 10 that he references the New Covenant, um, where he states in verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. This is the one prophesied by Jeremiah. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Okay, see, that's what, that's how we save our souls, is by allowing God to write his law upon our hearts and upon our minds. And the only way that that can happen is if we wash ourselves with the word of God. And he goes on in this uh, chapter, chapter 10, about having faith. And then um, verse 25 says to not neglect the Episanugogi, which is the word dealing with the second coming of Christ. doesn't talk about meeting together in church. It's talking about the doctrine of the second coming of Christ as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I see the day drawing near. And I've seen it for a long time. Then, as the day draws near, Christ's coming is near. Verse 26, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, after you received faith and believed in Jesus, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And then the final verse in Hebrews 10. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed by the lake of fire or by the second death. But we are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. So this is all dealing with the salvation of our soul, not our spirit. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We have faith to the preservation of our souls. 
And now let's look at some scriptures that uh, in the book of Matthew, things that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 8, the centurion, verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then we want to go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his soul will lose it. By the way, this word, the way that you know it's the word soul, it's the Greek word suke. And uh, if you get any kind of uh, concordance or uh, program that will go into the original Greek, you can find when it is the word for soul. And that's the word you look for, is suke. For whoever would save his soul will lose it, but whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. And what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Then in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, you have the parable of the talents. Jesus gave talents to each. Jesus has given talents to each of his servants. That's what this parable is about. Some of those, most of the servants do something with what Jesus has given them. But there's one who doesn't. He hides the talent. He hides the gift and the earth knowing that his Lord is a hard man. And so when Jesus comes to settle accounts with his servants, first Jesus says, well done to the faithful servants who use the talents. And says, enter into the joy of your master. Then he who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you, here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, the outer darkness is a lake of fire, the place of the second death. We have a choice. Do we obey God now? 
or not. And then finally, Revelation chapter 12, verse, starting with verse 7. Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their souls even unto death. Let us be accounted as these. What is the word of your testimony? Do you have a testimony? To the law, and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. We must have a light within us. Wash ourselves with the word of God. That will bring light into us. And then we will have testimony and we will overcome the dragon.